So what is end-to-end -end testing? Um, I'm going to read the slide at you, which is like rule number one of PowerPoint. Don't do that. But I'm going to start there anyways. A methodology used in the software development lifecycle to test the functionality and performance of an application under test. A boring definition, but um, what it really is, is making sure that you're testing the product not just as it's developed, meaning the way it's developed, not just in the way you've artificially broken out your pieces of the application, but as the user itself, itself, themselves, um, actually experiences the product. It's really a way of saying, let's test the whole stack together, like integration or system testing, but with a different focus. The focus is really on what I'll call experience, um, which we broke out here as functionality and performance. Yeah, I think you highlighted the important part there, Jeff, right? It's all about the user experience. And I think throughout this presentation, the most important thing for all of us as testers to have in mind is that we need to consider our user. Sometimes we can think about the functionality and the performance of, you know, different criteria we wanted to hit or we're just thinking metrics only but it's really important to have the perspective of the user journey and what is the user actually going to experience and that brings us right over to the goals yeah that worked out pretty well <laughs> yeah. nice transition just like we wrote this <laughs> so what is the goal of end time testing it's to simulate a user experience just as we discussed so you want to make sure that you're going through um, the motions of what your user is going to actually experience and here uh, you know, we were thinking about this and we were like, what is something that involves end-to-end -end testing? And a simple example is searching and logging on um, to crossbrowsertesting.com. So actually searching for crossbrowsertesting.com, clicking the login button, entering your user credentials, such as your username and password, clicking submit, and then having the application launch. So you want to make sure you're thinking about all the different steps the user is going to have to go through. And that is just one very, very simple example. Yeah, and I, actually it's one of the everybody uses the login example because it actually touches all of the systems, right? It's just an easy example for people to understand because um, you have a UI, you know, buttons you're clicking around, screens, mobile screens, whatever you have. Um, you have databases. You probably have external authentication. There's probably a third party in the case of things like single sign-on or, uh, you know, using Google sign-on or Facebook sign-on like a lot of logins do. It's a good example of how one piece of one scenario, one user action can actually touch, touch a ridiculous amount of subsystems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and why are we doing this? Well, it's all for validation, right? And Jeff, you just mentioned it. You know, you have the UI and the API layers. You also have databases and networks and everything and anything in between, especially when you start to add external application. Uh, external applications that you may have to call. So you want to make sure you're validating at every subsystem that Jeff just mentioned. And we'll call this out later, but it's important to also keep in mind, this isn't just pure verification of functionality. This is true validation, right? In other words, is my experience what I'm expecting? Not just does it work as I expected. In other words, hey, if I'm logging in, it takes 30 minutes, guess what? I'm not using this application anymore, but you might pass a functional test if you don't put timings in. So there is this extra piece beyond pure functional testing here. Yeah. And that's why, you, you know, we talked about it, verification versus validation. You want to make sure it behaves as expected and you want to make sure that the user is experiencing the experience you have created. Um, so next we're going to lead into, you know, why do end-to-end -end testing? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so why should you actually end-to-end -end test? This is a, we've covered some of this, um, so it's a little bit repetitive here, but there's a few pieces here that we haven't talked about yet. So first, you do actually want to make sure that everything's functioning. As much as I just said, you know, it's not just functional. Functionality is a little important. You need to make sure everything's working together, not just separately. Um, we call it confirming application health. Another person might call it integration testing or systems testing, depending on your scale. But um, importantly, one piece that people do tend to fall into a strange silo on is they'll do this for only the back end, APIs or database layer, or only the front end. You know, let's check, make sure everything's showing up on the screen correctly. Um, that isn't what we're talking about here. 
you know, this is a much bigger piece where you're actually trying to go through and check all of the systems. Yeah, and I think that's a really important piece, you know, is sometimes it's easy to get lost and I'm a UI tester, so that's all I care about, or I only test the API. But this really whole idea of end-to-end -end is such an integrated system and you need to consider all the subcomponents that are a part of it in order to ver verify that your application is working as expected. Yeah, I'm actually excited for the graphic later talking about that, but oh. I kind of, I always want to jump ahead, you know, <laughs> you know me. Um, the other one, expanding test coverage. This is actually an interesting one. A lot of times, even if you're testing every single unit, even if you're testing every single function, every feature, um, you're not always considering how the user is using it. That's a horrible sentence, user using it. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean, your end user. How, what are the, how are they actually, context are they in? I'm gonna give you an example of this. We just had a failure with the graphics not loading. We tested that beforehand in a different room. Guess what, it didn't work in this room. <laughs> um, don't yeah. know. I don't know why. Probably should. It's supposed to be all technical, but um, for whatever reason, it didn't work here. We didn't test test it in the correct context. We'll talk more about that later. Yeah, I think that was a pretty uh, good example there, Jeff. Though, thank you for calling me out for my graphics not working. But you're exactly spot on. You know, it's really hard to predict what are all the different environments that my user is going to be using my application in? You know, especially as you have applications that scale globally um, and scale as the number of devices continue to rise. It's really hard to predict, but if you can do end-to-end -end testing and think about these and really go in with a planning set of mind, you're able to expand your test coverage when you think about every environment that you should run your test on. And it's really just because you're focused on your end users versus the functionality of your application. Detecting bugs is an interesting one. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of bugs that show up like this. I mean, I just gave you an example of one with this graphics not showing up here. That's a bug. Um, if you're not testing the same way your users are experiencing your product, you won't detect every bug, but they will because that's how they're using it. So you want to detect the bugs before the end users, obviously. The only real way to do that is to at least have some testing that's going through end to end your entire system the same way it's used in the actual real world. And then producing testing resources. This is a complicated one. It's almost counterintuitive because we'll cover it later, but we do say like, hey, these are on top of your existing tests. That should cost more resources. Well, no, it doesn't. Um, several reasons for that. One, by resources, we don't just mean you know, people, money. Time is a resource. Actually, one of the ones you can never get back. So that is a very important thing. You do want to catch this stuff before users do. It's a lot easier to fix stuff before it's released. Another one is, um, honestly, it's defects fix time. There's a huge benefit for being able to detect that each function's working, but they're not working together, or that they're not working together in the right context. It makes it a lot easier for a developer to fix it. That's not truly a testing resource, but the faster your developer fixes a problem, the less likely it is that some other fix is going to affect it, right? There's always many, many moving pieces, so if you can fix one of those pieces quickly, you're less likely to have interfering actions. Interfering actions, it's horrible. It's like a band name. Um. You made it work. That's okay. But yeah, I think these are all just some of the benefits. Um, I think if we were to sit here and le lecture on all of the benefits, you'd get pretty bored pretty quickly. But these are some of the ones that we thought were the most important ones and uh, the most uh, important to highlight at did, the did end of the day. Did you boring? No, I did not. 